Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. No one thinks we have the balls to pull this off. Okay, girls. Let's go get them. Hello, I'm Anna Smith, and welcome to Girls on Film with the BFI. My guests this week are Frida Pinto, Harriet Finney, and Daze Agaji, and our topic is activism. Of course, there have been many wonderful films about female activists, from Suffragette to Harriet, and this week there's an urgent new documentary out about Greta Thunberg, the climate activist. I Am Greta is a fascinating insight into the life of the Swedish teenager who skipped school, took on political leaders and inspired an international movement. With plenty of behind the scenes footage, I Am Greta is an inspiring watch. But of course Greta isn't the only young woman fighting for change. Here in Britain, 20-year-old Daze Agaji is a climate justice activist, a political candidate and also a member of the Extinction Rebellion movement. I asked her what inspired her to be an activist. I feel like the first time that I became formally involved in activism was in January 2019. But I feel like through growing up, my mum always gave us this ethos of providing a better world for the next generation to come. And although like I didn't really see it as a point of activism, it kind of is. Now you are very involved with Extinction Rebellion. How would you describe the atmosphere at the events? Oh God, I, I remember I did this panel in Italy and they said, Days, Extinction Rebellion must be really special because when you talk about it, you have a sparkle in your eye. And I think that's the only way I can really like be able to communicate how amazing it feels to be part of it. Because it's like, I always see like activism and especially Extinction Rebellion and protests as it's half of the vision of the way that you want the world to be. People connecting as people, the community, the resistance um, and the um, the malleability to the world that happens around us. But also there is that kind of like not taking like no for an answer, especially when it comes to things like life and death. And it is that kind of like grittiness of, you know, we are all here with this common purpose, but also the fact that we're all here because we love so strongly. We love the earth, we love the people around us, we love our community, and that's what we're fighting for. Well, you've said before that you feel strongly about being visible as a black climate activist. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think um, when I was growing up, I was always kind of told that caring about the environment was very much like a white thing to do, or the thing for white people. Um, and I think it, it, it's definitely not. I always see like the OGs of climate activism were the indigenous people who were fighting from their lands, uh, from the colonist. And that's that's the truth, at least in my eyes. And I feel like there are so many people, especially um, ethnic minorities, who are fighting, especially through the feeling climate change and having lived experience in these areas and that we need to be a lot more vocal and we need to make sure that there is representation for us because I hope that you know in the same way that when I was younger there wasn't that many climate activists let alone like black climate activists around that hopefully there is someone that's young who sees loads of people who are just like them and say I can do this too. How do you feel about celebrity supporters like Emma Thompson? Um, does that help the cause? Mm, yeah, kind of. I like, I don't know, I kind of see them just as people. And I don't think they're any more important to the cause than, you know, Bob from the off license down the road. Um, I think all of us need to be here, need to be here in full strings and wholeheartedly as well. Everyone is welcomed and this should be for everyone. What have been the biggest challenges you've overcome in your journey as you've become more high profile and involved in the cause? I, yeah, I think the challenges is the hate. Like, it's, it's one of those where it's quite surprising that people would hate someone for doing something that's so out of love and literally depends on caring. A lot of the time, the hate isn't about the environment or what I'm saying about the environment. It's normally about my race or my gender or my age. And that's where they seem to, you know, attack me from. So I think it's quite hard. And I feel like that's something that I wasn't particularly prepared for coming into this, especially in like a more, you know, frontline way. But that's, I, I think it's a conversation that, you know, society needs to have with itself. Now you've watched the film, I Am Greta. What did you think of it? Yeah, I thought it was pretty impactful. I feel like, um, a lot of the time because my life kind of revolves around crisis with the activism and the you know the job that I do but it was that is that humbling moment to realize that you're not really in this alone in the same ways that you feel like hearing the statistics and feeling the grief someone else feels that too and I think it was quite in, in a way comforting to know that you're not in this alone. 
Did you learn anything you didn't know about her as a person? Yeah, I think it's just like um, a lot of the time, like the media kind of sees Gretchen as like quite a mo moody looking person and they make her seem like she just like goes around spreading, you know, prophecies of doom as Donald Trump says. <laughs> but um, to see her just like enjoying the everyday parts of life, the, you know, the making fun, the laughing, the, the joy, and you can clearly connect to why she wants to, you know, fight for the planet is because with the planet, we can experience all of that. Now, why should people watch this film and listen to Greta? Well, I think it's 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 to watch the film, at least for me, it was it was just that kind of understanding of, you know, there is someone who's out there who, who is fighting. And I don't think it's even specifically to listen to Greta, but I think it's to listen to the science. It's to listen, not even just the science, it's to listen to the human experience as well, because I feel like with the climate, so many people like connect to it in such different ways. Like, for example, I connect to the climate mostly through people and people's experiences. And, you know, a statistic about, you know, four degrees warming could not scare me as much as, you know, hearing about someone's home in the Amazon being burnt to the ground, you know. And I feel like this, it, it gives many different entryways of being able to experience nature in the environment, especially moving more towards like indigenous ways of being of not seeing humans as different or separate to nature but seeing us as a part of that you know and i think um through the film it did bring up even in small doses all these kind of ideas especially within me do you think film is a useful tool for activism definitely i think it is it is that informative bit and also it, it brings so much empathy to it and i think that's the thing that film has the beauty to do we can start to empathize with people in certain situations and and living through that and seeing through their eyes almost um we can see like you know why greta finds the climate climate crisis so scary you know because you're seeing through her eyes through film and that's why i think it's it's really important is there anything else you wanted to share with the viewers in regards to your work all of yeah, I think everything I do is is it's literally like hoping for a call to action for someone. And I think taking this as a call to action to do something, you know, like we we experience like the world in an unstable climate right now. And we can see how all of us actually find small bits of the world. And even during a pandemic, we've all had good memories, which even sounds a bit crazy. Um, but imagine if we were actually in a healthy world in a healthy like space imagine if we were in a stable climate imagine what life could feel like then and i think it's just holding on to that hope because having hope is so gritty and being a pessimist is very easy and i think we need to remember that in a bit more of the ways that we think i am greta is in cinemas now and to find out where it's playing near you go to iamgreta.film to find out more about extinction rebellion go to extinctionrebellion.uk My next guest is the Indian actor Frida Pinto, who shot to fame in 2008 with Slumdog Millionaire. She's since appeared in Hollywood blockbusters like Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and she was also in the Netflix comedy Love Wedding Repeat, which you might have seen recently. She's also starred in thought-provoking films about the female experience, from the sex trafficking drama Love, Sonia, to Michael Winterbottom's Trishna, which was a modern update on the Tess of the D'Urberville story. As well as being an actor and producer, Frida is involved in humanitarian causes and feminist causes. So I asked her which of her films have inspired her to take action. I think Trishna was the first film that kind of got me very in tune with the disparity between what girls in cities and urban areas um, have access to and what girls in smaller towns, villages and more rural areas have access to. And I think, you know, when you think of a country like India at large, you may think that women have it a bit rough. And that is only true to the extent that, you know, certain classes and certain cities and certain urban areas may have it somewhat better, if not easier, but somewhat better than the, than the rest of the country. So what kind of organizations have you become involved with about those kind of causes that you feel passionately about? I was already involved with Girl Rising, which is uh, an organization that I'm still involved with. And through Girl Rising, Let Girls Learn, which was Michelle Obama's campaign that is now Global Girls Alliance. Um, these are the organizations that I was always involved with because I kind of felt like I would love to kind of do policy work and 
and, and do all of the stuff that kind of makes the needle move. But it's also important to recognize what your strengths are and then use that strength to um, support and, and push forward the other work that needs to happen. Um, so my, I feel like truly my um, strength um, lies in storytelling and um, being a voice. And I don't like saying being voice for the voiceless because no one is voiceless. It's just how much platform they have, uh, if they have one, and um, how we encourage them to speak because every girl wants to speak up. You know, they've just not been encouraged to or they've been told they cannot. So I presume for that, for what you're saying there, is that when you look at scripts and you're choosing what role to play, are you thinking about what kind of good it can do in the world or what kind of message that story can give? I'm, I'm always careful about picking roles that don't make the woman in the, in the film or the female character in the film or the TV show feel agentless, you know, because I feel like to not have your agency, whatever it may be, you don't have to be the perfect doing everything right at every step of the way kind of person uh, or character. Um, and even if you're flawed, and I kind of particularly love flawed characters because that's who we all are as humans. We are not perfect at all. Um, and also, so so yeah, so we when I pick up these hopefully two-dimensional, uh, more than, you know, multi-dimensional characters, I must say, um, I, I kind of hope that no matter which woman is watching that movie or the TV show that she finds something that is relatable. However, just because I want to push forward a social cause, I don't just pick social cause movies, you know, because then, then as an actor and as an artist, I don't feel satisfied. So I want to do everything from the commercial to the, the soap-like and, and to the very, very gritty, um, sometimes darker material as well, as long as there's something hopeful at the end of the movie or the TV show. Now, you mentioned sort of it's a stressful time. Um, and obviously in a pandemic, people's mental health is suffering. I know that's another thing that you feel strongly about. Um, how do you feel we can help each other in these times? Well, first things first, by just being kind. You know, I think that's so important to kind of not just jump to a conclusion and read something in the 140 characters on Twitter and then just decide that you've passed your judgment and, and this person or this organization or this individual is evil. You know, I think that's the other thing. What is happening right now is we're all so hungry for answers and under mismanagement and bad leadership, we are all spiraling out of control. I don't know, it's a very like kind of a, a way in which I'm, it almost makes me sound like I'm telling people to stop being informed. But I feel there's too much information. Back away from it. You know, that excessive information, which can be truthful but can also not be truthful, is what also makes us spiral out of control. So I feel like taking a break from social media, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, please watch Social Dilemma, the documentary on Netflix, and, and know for yourself how all of our minds are being twisted and played for the benefit of big corporations and their pockets. So I feel if we can just st take a step away and really see what is going on, we've all just become in some shape or form pawns and puppets in the hands of these big corporations. So claim your power and step away and, and, and take time for yourself. That's kind of one of the most important things. You know, we, none of us are taking time for ourselves right now. We're just all bothered, bothered about what the next step is going to be. And in all of this, so many people who have lost their jobs and livelihood and and whatnot, I mean, it just seems to be that like the number is growing larger and larger and larger. And I don't think we're helping when we kind of, you know, fall prey to a rumor or fall pr prey to um, conspiracy theories. But I feel more so now than ever, it is important that women, young women, come together to kind of support each other and lift each other up, not fall prey to the competitive, you know, elbowing one out of the way. And then more important than ever, I feel, we just have to take a deep breath before we say something, before we say something or do something that is rash or emotionally charged that will not land in the most effective way that we need it to land because there's so much noise around us and you don't want to be noise at this point in time you want to be someone who has made an impact so it's okay 
to not be in a hurry to say something and it's okay to take a deep breath to formulate your thoughts and your actions and then go out and do it and have um, and achieve scale, you know, and, and, and create a bigger impact. That was Frida Pinto. You can next see her on Netflix in the upcoming film Hillbilly Elegy. That's directed by Ron Howard and it stars Amy Adams and Glenn Close. Finally, on Girls on Film, we consider ourselves to be feminist activists, but I never thought I'd have to campaign to save cinemas from extinction until now. The pandemic has forced Cineworld and picture houses to close their doors, hopefully temporarily, but other cinemas are of course struggling. I spoke to the BFI's Director of External Affairs, Harriet Finney, and asked her how serious the problem was. I think the thing that we really have to remember is this is not this is not a broken industry. We came into lockdown doing unbelievably well. And I'm mean, just to put that in context, last year was one of the best years we've had actually for cinema going and attendance in this country. And we were one of the countries actually still showing growth in cinema going. And the industry was actually credited with keeping the country out of recession, basically. We also need to remember that actually, if you have a look at what happened at the beginning of lockdown when cinemas were closed and we were all at home, we've done quite a lot of work in terms of taking audience surveys, sentiments, etc. And film was one of the things that absolutely kept people sane during lockdown. You know, where we are now is definitely more challenging. I mean, significantly more challenging than I think we'd all hoped uh, when we started opening cinemas back up again in, in the early summer. So there are a whole variety of reasons that it's been challenging. I mean, obviously one of the big things is audience anxiety. So we have done vast amounts of work, working with the Trade Association, the UKCA, on making sure that cinemas are really safe places to go. And I mean, to date, there hasn't been a single record of COVID being caught in a cinema anywhere. So that is really good. They are super safe places to go. I think there's also an issue, again, around all the guidance that's coming out and changing on a weekly basis. I think people are just confused. I think people don't understand that cinemas are actually open again quite often. And then you've got the fact that you're entering into all these new tiers that were announced this week. And again, you hear actually what's going to happen at tier three, bars and restaurants close. Actually, cinemas don't close, even on the very highest alert. You've also got the issue that you have got a lack of temples a lack of those really big films, which are unfortunately the big drivers for keeping cinema doors open. Um, so if you look, I mean, Tenet performed unbelievably well, actually, we feel um, in the UK market. But the issue is that that is 50% of all box office revenues. So then once you've kind of, you've got the audience anxiety piece, you've got the fact that audiences are down, revenues are down, you've got the lack of the big temple films to keep the big chains ticking over, obviously the impact is going to be that you're going to start seeing some of them closing their doors over the winter. So we've seen that with Cineworld, which has obviously taken Picture House with it, closing its doors. You've got View and Odeon moving down to part-time schedules. So that's the kind of big picture, but there are, there are some bright lights within it as well. And independent film is actually, we think, one of them. Well, that's right. I was going to ask you, are there actually silver linings here for independent cinema? So one of the things that has happened is independent film all of a sudden is actually getting a lot more attention a lot more traction a lot more screen time essentially and we've seen some really lovely stories and some fantastic performances of our kind of very own british domestic indigenous productions so rocks did really really well we've got saint maud which came out last weekend which is already number two in the box office doing really really well attracting audiences who may never have gone to see a film like rocks or a film like saint maud before we're also getting a lot of cinemas reporting quite new audiences coming through the doors and that's a real positive so actually many more young audiences and even we at the bfi bfi south bank have seen a real change in the demographics coming through the door um, so that's encouraging and good news the other thing is, is that independent cinemas are still open. Um, and part of that is because they have been captured by the government cultural recovery scheme. So there was a huge fund announced back in July. Part of that is to help them just buy the health and safety kit that they need. 
Um, and the other uh, part of it is in terms of business sustainability. So actually allowing them to open their doors when actually it wouldn't be financially viable to do so otherwise. I think we'll probably be able to support about three or 400 independent cinemas across the UK, keep their doors open to people over the winter. What can audiences do to help keep cinema alive? Keep going. Please keep going. So I think one of the things that is fantastic about independent cinema, and it's what we've really seen in terms of the, the difference between how the circuits are finding life at the moment and how the independent cinemas, independent cinemas cultivate their audiences and they work with you in terms of developing your taste, developing what films you might see, showing you such a wide variety. And so I think you build a relationship with your local cinema. And of course, I mean, for many, Picture House has played a really key role. Um, you know, it's sitting bang in the middle of the high street. It's a place where you can go and have a coffee. You can watch a film, you can meet friends. So I think as you know, my big plea would be, please don't desert your local cinema. Please keep going. They are really safe places. If anybody has been to cinema, you'll realize you're not sitting near anybody. The cleaning protocols are huge. So you can still go and have a great time. And it's going to be, let's face it, with these tier two, tier three lockdowns, it's going to be one of the only joys that we can have that will take us out of the home. Thanks to the BFI for partnering with Girls on Film on this episode. As you have heard, the arts still really need your support. So if you think you can spare just a fiver, then please text BFI at home to 70085 and that'll cost £5 plus your standard message rate. Thank you very much for your support. You've been watching Girls on Film. If you'd like to hear more from our audio podcast, the link is below the screen right here and we'll be back on the BFI's YouTube soon. See you then. <laughs>